All right, we're going to begin with the celestial sphere. And as you can see, it's broken up into different regions. Each of these regions is defined by a constellation in that particular area of the sky. That's what the celestial sphere is, a map of the sky. Remember that it's an imaginary sphere in which the Earth is in the center. And if we have um, the Earth on a rotating axis like we have here, projecting upward will give us the North Celestial Pole at that point at the, the top. And then, of course, down here south is a South Celestial Pole. The projection of the Earth's equator out on this to the celestial sphere represented by this metal ring, the celestial equator. Now we've talked about this already in class, but I, what I wanted to talk about also is that yellow sphere that's inside of here. That's really where we left off. Now that turns out to be a model of the sun. And we know that the sun is much bigger than the earth, but in this particular model, it's actually quite small. I mean, after all, when you look at the sun in the sky, you can put the sun behind your finger. So its angular size is actually quite small. It's a big object, but very far away, obviously. Now you'll notice that this uh, yellow sphere is actually on a rod, and if you rotate this, the path of this yellow sphere across the sky will represent the path of the sun. It turns out that it uh, can cross the celestial equator right here. It will rise up and get about this high on the celestial sphere. It will cross again back over there and then come back over here, go down to about this far on the celestial sphere, and then back up here again. I talk about it in such great detail because that's key to the coordinate systems that we use on the celestial sphere. This path of the sun shown in red right here is key to our coordinate systems for stars. This uh, yellow path that we're talking about here is called the ecliptic. Some things that you need to know about the ecliptic is number one is the path of the sun across the celestial sphere. So the sun moves through the stars. I mean, you really can't see that because in the daytime, the sun is, you know, hiding all the constellations from us. But it turns out that it's just moving in front of the 12 zodiac constellations throughout the year, just creeping across there. Now, it turns out that the sun is not actually moving. It's us that's moving. But from our perspective, it looks like the sun is rising and setting. It looks like it's going through constellations. So that's the perspective we're going to talk about. So from our perspective, it looks like the sun is going across the celestial sphere. And um, this red curve that you see here is tilted a little bit with respect to the green one, which is the celestial equator. So this angle right here, 23 and a half degrees between the celestial equator and the ecliptic. The reason it's 23 and a half degrees is because the Earth's axis is, tw is tilted 23 and a half degrees. It's a little typo right here. The second bullet should say um, ecliptic means places of eclipses. So our ancestors noticed that the solar and lunar eclipses would always occur in these dozen or so constellations around the ecliptic. They would always occur in the same uh, collection of um, constellations. Now. Um, there are two intersection points between this red thing and the green thing. And by red, I mean ecliptic and celestial equator. So there's an uh, intersection point here and an intersection point over there. Uh, this is called the vernal equinox. It turns out that when the sun is right there, it takes place on the same day of the year, roughly every year. Um, and vernal means spring, and equinox means um, equal days, equal nights. In other words, on this day of the year, there is 12 hours of daylight, roughly, and 12 hours of darkness. So equal nights. I guess you can think of it in that way anyway. This is the first day of spring. Um, as this, uh, the year goes along, uh, the sun will rise up on the celestial um, sphere, going across the ecliptic up here, until the sun gets to its stopping position here. So the sun rises and then it reaches a stopping position and it starts to come back down. And SOL stands for sun, and then the last of this is stop. So the sun stops when it gets right up to the top. And it turns out that during that time of year, around June 22nd, in the Northern Hemisphere at least, um, that's our summertime. 
Um, the other intersection point occurs on the first day of fall. I think it's around September 22nd or so, something like that, the first day of fall. And on this day, you also have 12 hours of daylight and 12 hours of darkness. Now on the summer solstice, it's not that way. You have more than 12 hours of daylight and less than 24 hour, uh, less than 12 hours of darkness. And I bet you know what this point down here is called. That is the winter solstice. And here we have more hours of darkness and um, than uh, daylight. And also in the northern hemisphere, the sunlight is more at a, an angle here. So we don't get the direct sunlight and therefore it's uh, cooler during this time of year. So this is what really causes seasons is that uh, tilt of the Earth's axis. That's really what causes um, the seasons on the Earth. We mentioned this in class a little bit, that this uh, coordinate system that is very similar to latitude um, is measured above and below the celestial equator from zero degrees on the celestial equator to positive 90 up here, negative 90 there. You'll be using that in your laboratory exercises early on this semester. And the blue arrow is measured around the celestial equator, uh, along the celestial equator like longitude and notice that the place that you start is the vernal equinox. That's the part we didn't get to in class last time. So uh, instead of starting at Greenwich, England, like you would do for longitude, you actually start at the vernal equinox, measure around. The other thing that's different, and you might remember from longitude, we went from zero degrees to 180 east, zero degrees to 180 west. But in the case of right ascension, astronomers have um, introduced a new angular measurement. It's 0 superscript h up to 24 superscript h. And it, so it looks like it's an hour, which is a unit of time, but really it's an hour unit of angle, where 24 hours of angle corresponds to 360 degrees. It's kind of an odd thing if you think about it, but um, suppose you start here and you went all the way around here, that would correspond to 360 degrees, but it also would correspond to 24 hours in our new unit of angular measurement called hours. So declination measured in degrees, right ascension measured in hours. Some more earth terms. It's important that we distinguish between two key things that deal with spinning and circular motion. The two terms here are rotation and orbit. We want to make sure we keep those separate as we begin to talk about stars, planets, and galaxies this semester. A spinning about an axis like the Earth spinning about its axis once every 24 hours, that's going to be referred to as rotation. And then uh, as it moves around the sun in its orbit, we can call that revolution about the sun. That happens uh, 365 and a quarter rotations um, uh, days you know, uh, per, per year. Um, now there is another way to look at this ecliptic, and that is in terms of a plane. It really defined a plane in our previous diagram, but I want to show you in this next sketch a couple of things. And we want to focus on the ecliptic plane and the axis tilt of the Earth. So here's the drawing coming up next. So this is uh, not a celestial sphere model, but instead more of a somewhat re more realistic model. I like how it says not to scale because the sun is obviously much bigger than that. Um, the size of the earth is uh, magnified to, so that you can see this uh, tilt of the earth's axis. So this circle here is the earth's orbit and it defines the ecliptic plane. So this blue thing is called the ecliptic plane. Um, so the red line we saw on the celestial sphere is called just the ecliptic but the plane that exists actually out in space is called the ecliptic plane. The other thing that we notice is that um, the axis of the Earth is tilted. You probably already knew that already, but I want you to know that it's, it's pointing to a relatively bright star called Polaris, also known as the North Star. So Polaris and the North Star, they're the same thing. And you'll notice that during uh, this season right here, I think this might be the vernal equinox. Uh, the, uh, you know, it's pointing up and to the right to Polaris. We notice the same kind of thing out here for the autumnal equinox. So this 23 and a half degrees 
is the cause of those you know red and green circles shown before uh, being at a tilt of 23 and a half degrees. One thing you should also know as we get into some multiple choice questions is as it tries to demonstrate here the seasons are caused by the tilt of the Earth's axis. It's not that the Sun and the Earth are any closer in the summertime like this right here. It's just that the part where we're at is tilted more toward the Sun in the summertime and tilted more away from the Sun in the wintertime. So the cause of seasons on any planet, it turns out, is the tilt of an axis with respect to the um, orbital plane. You'll notice your textbook also refers to this as the spring equinox and the fall equinox rather than um, the vernal equinox and the autumnal equinox. Uh, I think those are still the same. All right, I'll go on and uh, make the next video and I'll see you shortly.